Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the New Variety Art Show. I'm sure glad you're back because we've got some exciting programs coming up in the next few weeks for you. And uh, we want to tell you what the New Variety Art Show is all about. It's about variety artists in the 90s. Clowns, mimes, jugglers, magicians, hypnotists, psychics, belly dancers, mentalists, uh, puppeteers, you name it, caricaturists. They're, they've all been here. They'll all be here. And we're very excited. So call the neighbors. Get the uh, kids around the TV set for another half hour of uh, variety arts entertainment. Uh, we want you to know that the variety artists that we have on our program are the up-and-coming stars of tomorrow and the stars of today. So we hope that by giving you this chance to meet these folks one-on-one, -on -one, you'll have a little better appreciation of what they do the next time you get a chance to see a variety arts performer live and in person. And we also want to hear from you. We want to know what you think about our program, the new Variety Arts Show. And if you'll please get on the phone and give us a call and let us know what you liked or maybe what you didn't like. And if you have an idea for a show or if you have a variety arts uh, performance of some kind, an event coming up, let us know. We'll try to promote it on the show and let everybody know where they can see Variety Arts here in the Valley. Right now, I'd like to introduce a guy we like to hear from a lot around here, our musical director, Mr. Van Corriton. Hi, Van. Good to be back. Thanks for being here again. Enjoyed everything. The Snake Charmer. Oh, yes. We finally had, uh, we finally had your belly, belly dancers, dancers on. That right. was a lot of yeah, fun. Sure a lot was. of fun. Well, tell us again real quick where people can come and see you. They can catch me most afternoons for high tea at the Phoenician in the tea court. The Fabulous Phoenician Resort. Fabulous Phoenician. That's right. Hey, there's been a lot going on. We want to cover some yeah, uh, material what you got here. There. First of all, one of the uh, one of the people that uh, was on our program previously, Troy Neighbors. Remember right, Troy Neighbors? Right. He uh, was on the show and he sent us a very nice note. Uh, thank you, Brad, for having me on your show. It was nice seeing you. Sending you a picture of my national award. If you uh, oh, maybe right. you didn't know this here, let me dig this out. He won the Andy. Uh, let me see, Andy Womack Award. Great. And this is the saddle that they presented him at the Phoenix JCs. Uh, this is a national award, and very few people get these, so he was real proud of that. Couldn't and we're proud, nicer proud of Troy Neighbors and glad he was able to be here. So thanks, Troy, and we'll hope to see you again around real soon. By the way, variety arts performers are making the news all over the place. Here, for instance, let me read this real quick. Uh, Chico the Clown uh, with the Culpe uh, Culpepper and Merriweather Circus, Arizona's only big top circus, made the cover of the uh, Glendale Star. So congratulations, right. Chico, and we, uh, we hope that... Uh, You'll get a chance to see the Culpeper and Merriweather Circus when it comes to your neighborhood. Now, not only local news, but national, national news. news. Oh, okay. we got things to talk about here. First of all, in People Magazine with Nick Nolte, who, by the way, was a Phoenix resident. Right. And I saw this man uh, perform in The Last Pad by William Inge before anybody knew mm -hmm. who Nick Nolte was. So uh, we're sorry he didn't win the Academy Award. Oh, well. But anyway, in this particular issue, uh, they did a whole series of, of uh, little vignettes on public access television programs. There's a guy who does uh, chef's things. And, of course, this is in response to the Wayne's World uh, mm -hmm. party on, dudes. So anyway, there's a lot of stuff in here, and I, I'm very upset with People Magazine why they didn't call us and put us in their issue. Okay. <laughs> now, now, who says variety arts performers aren't on top of things? Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a ventriloquist in Annapolis, Maryland, and he claims he's filing suit against Pepsi, and he claims, uh, he claims that he is the one that... Uh, came up with the uh-huh that uh, Pepsi's now using. Uh -huh. Ray Charles, you've got the right one, uh-huh. Uh -huh. And we'll be, uh, we'll be keeping track of that lawsuit to see if he wins. Now, here's what I'm upset about. This, uh, this is Bobcat Goldsworth mm. as Shakes the Clown here. And this is this movie that has come out, uh, Trashing Clowns. Right. Uh, he said some very libelous things like clowns are felons and they're not <laughs> funny. And the only people that will watch them are kids in hospitals where they can't get up and run away from them. And we, if you disagree, call us and let us know because I think this is uh, 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 not, just don't go see the movie. It's not worth it. All right? Clown Van, press. we have a very exciting guest today. And uh, he's someone that I've wanted on our show for a very long time, right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm glad he's finally made it. And we're we're lucky to have him. Uh, I've worked with this gentleman many, many times. He's one of the most talented and successful performers in the Valley of the Sun. He's an actor, he's a director, he's a playwright, an entertainer, and most of you will recognize him as a 
mime. He's been on TV commercials and billboards all over the valley. And uh, today we're going to talk with Alan Pruitt. But before Great. we do that, before we do that, we'd like you to take a look at this video clip of Alan Pruitt on a recent uh, TV news spot that was done on him. And when we come back, we'll meet Alan Pruitt in person. Stay tuned. You make of it sometimes fun, sometimes grueling. But if you're lucky this year on your shopping excursions, you may run across someone who can put a touch of love on the process. I let them discover me in my surroundings, in my reality. And if they choose then to interact with me and to play with me, then I encourage that. Alan Pruitt is a professional mime artist. He calls his art form a living painting. On this day, he played the character Pierrot, who loves to give love. And in return, Alan just wants a smile. And sometimes that's all I'm after. If they'll just take a moment and you see someone with this look on their face, and if they just take a moment to go, that's all I'm after. Now, you may have noticed, but mimes traditionally don't talk. What do people try to do to get you to talk? Tickle me. Um, <laughs> lots of tickling. Uh, some little children like to uh, pounce on my toes from time to time to see if I will scream. But if the youngsters can be precocious, it's the older ones who understand Alan's work. I think the older people have the, the best response to me um, because they've lived a long time and they've seen a lot and they see a lot in what I do. Some of them jump at the chance to be a child again. Alan Pruitt is so good because he studied with the best, Marceau and Kipnis, but he's also good because in the midst of bad times and busy shoppers, he steals a little love from all those folks he touches. It's my way of giving and making a contribution, and if it, it is only to make people smile or laugh or see themselves uh, for just a split second, that's important to me. Mary Jo, you said that Alan is a professional mime, yes. but does he do it full time? Well, a lot of businesses hire him out, but when he's not doing mime, he's running the cookie company, which, which is Phoenix Hill Theater's Children's Theater. Mm -hmm. Busy and guy. Very busy, very talented. What? That was Alan Pruitt as Emo the Mime, and he's here with us today on the New Variety Art Show, but today he can speak and talk, and we're glad that he's here. Thank, Thank you, Alan, for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I've wanted to have you on the show since the very beginning because uh, you are so visible and successful here in the Valley of the Sun that I didn't feel that our show would be complete without a visit from Alan Pruitt. Well, thank you. You're very kind. And uh, thank you for making time in your busy schedule because uh, most folks know we tape for later broadcast. Uh, you are, as we speak, on your way to the Zony Awards for 92. That's uh, correct. Tell us about that. Well, um, I, one of the plays that I've written for Phoenix Little Theater's Cookie Company, I write about four shows a year for them. Uh, one of those from last season called Young Amelia Earhart has been nominated for a Zony Award, and it's just a nomination, so well, I haven't I'm, won yet. I'm sure that you're a shoe-in for <laughs> this. Uh, I'm sure you were probably interested to hear about the uh, new news uh, reports about uh, possibly discovering where she went well, down. Yeah, interesting was last year they discovered the box that they thought came from her plane, and that came just about the time that the play was ready to open, and this year when the nomination came out, they found <laughs> a part of her plane. Um, but I, I understand now that they've decided that it is not part of her plane. That's what I heard. Somebody said the uh, metal didn't fit. So we're still looking uh, for her. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, another play that you wrote is currently in production, and that is about young... Alexander, Alexander Graham Bell, correct. Well, so you like to go back and take, uh, take a look at historical figures? Is that... Uh, well, of? most of the plays that I write for Phoenix Little Theater's Cookie Company is a classic literature, original scripts based on classic literature, but we started a few years ago a historical series called... Um, the historical series? No, we... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's called... Um, young American series oh. and the idea is to do plays about young Americans early in their life um, so that children understand that a lot of very famous people and very uh, prominent people in our community in our country didn't have it so great you know some mm. of them um, came from broken homes some of them were poor 
had but much they still to overcome. Right, had exactly. much to overcome. Let's put this in perspective for folks because uh, we've talked about the cookie company, and I probably should have started by asking you to define the cookie company. You are the managing director of that for That's Phoenix correct. Little Theater. Tell us what is the cookie company? Well, I've been. Um, the cookie company is uh, professional adult actors performing for children. We do sometimes use children if it's called for in the script. Um, we've been in existence now, this is our 11th season, and uh, all of the actors are, are professional. Um, they do get paid for their work. The reason we're called the cookie company is because they get cookies and milk when they come to see the show. It's fashioned after... The a, audience is not the actors. Right, right. right. Okay. The children. Most of the right. children. But we give them to the adults. We don't discriminate right. based on age. So this, this is primarily aimed at young people. This is young people. Four theater. to 11 year old. Yeah. yeah. Now right. do you take this out and tour it? Travel it no, around? No, no. We, we stay at the theater. We do have a program, an educational program called Young Theater Goers that schools take field trips to. Oh, I see. Um, I think it's important that they understand that theater is worthy of going to be seen. Right. And so we don't go and, and perform in their cafeteria. They have to come right. to us. There's a study guide that goes along with it with vocabulary and games and things so oh, that they see. have a uh, a good experience. Sure not More MTV, just, is it? No. <laughs> I want to talk about you, your background, where you got started, how you got started, where you went to school, that kind of thing. Can you give us a brief thumbnail biography well, of yourself? Brief. Uh, you know how actors are. Um, <laughs> so just cut me off if I'm going too long. But I'm letting you warm I, up for your acceptance speech tonight. <laughs> <laughs> to um, I actually started when I was three years old um, doing, doing things and putting together shows for the neighborhood. and um, But Professionally, the first professional thing I did was when, when I was in high school, uh -huh. and uh, I knew from the time I was about 12 that I was going to be an actor. That's what I wanted to do, be in show business and theater. Uh, were you born and raised here in the Valley? No, in or? St. Louis. I in was born and raised in St. St. Louis. Louis. I've been in the Valley now about 12 years. Uh -huh. What brought you out? Uh, in 1980. Um, position with the City of Phoenix. Uh, I was the theater and dance coordinator for the City of Kansas City, Missouri for... Ooh five years and then a similar position came up here in Phoenix and I took that position but I only stayed for a year because it wasn't exactly what I, I wanted to be yeah. doing here and uh, well it sounds like you found your niche now <laughs> well I, I um, yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Uh, Let's talk about mime, if we can, uh, because that's one of the major things in your life, uh, and certainly one of the things most people recognize you uh, for doing. How, how did you get started in mime? Where did that uh, grow out of? Well, I, you know, I find this interesting because you, uh, you perceive it as that, and many people perceive that as the case, and mime was never intended to be part, a big part of my life. I, um, Start years ago in 1972, I was introduced to Marcel Marceau in Chicago and studied with him for about four days. Uh, it was a personal, he was a personal friend of another friend and that's how I sort of learned mime and then I've also worked with Claude Kipnis and I just reserved that because I was starting to be an actor uh -huh. and a director and so I used the mime in my acting and directing but didn't intend to be a mime. I pulled it out a few times to use it for special events and for promotions and people started saying, well, listen, uh, you know, do you do parties? Uh, do you do openings? <laughs> I've got a, an art gallery opening. Can you come in? And you remind me of Red Skelton and you remind me of uh, Marcel Marceau. And so I just, it, uh, it just evolved. It kind of, it kind of grew, uh, grew up out of that just by accident. Yes, then. yes. Very good. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that I wanted to ask you was, uh, because you do a lot of mime, and that's probably where most people know you from visibly, you know, that they can identify they've seen you, is why mimes sometimes get a bad rap. Uh, you do a lot of cocktail parties and things, grand openings like you were saying, and some people love to have you come over and do something for them, and other people, oh, get a, you know, they don't want anything to do with it. And I think it's a misinterpretation sometimes on people's part. Uh, what, what do you think we can do to change that? Well, I, I, some of it is that people, th there are some children who grow up who simply didn't have a good experience with a clown and so they have this fear. I think the biggest part of the problem is that they've been exposed to bad mimes. They've been exposed, uh, for a long time people just thought they could just go out and put white on their face and not say anything and they could become a mime and they don't understand that there's a great deal of training um, that goes into recognizing those people and being able to deal with them on their level uh, on, and on that basis. Um, if I see someone who tends not to, I mean I'm I've very seldom ever been confronted with someone who says simply, get out of here, leave me alone. Mm -hmm. uh, I generally am sensitive enough to see when 
someone is a little hesitant. Sometimes they'll say, they'll, they, they'll say something, I see they're uncomfortable, and I back away from them. And then very gradually, I'll try, in the course of the evening, I try to work myself back around them once in a while so that maybe this time will make a difference. Maybe I can make them a little more comfortable so right. the next time they don't have a bad experience. Not only training and education and practice, but a great deal of psychology involved. Psychology and sensitivity to right. people's feelings. I, I mean, I don't have to make everyone in the room laugh, and <laughs> everyone right. there doesn't have to like me. Right. It's okay. I want to talk real quick about some of the other characters that you do. Most people know you do emo, but you also do a number of others. Tell us what are some of the other talents that you have, as if you don't have enough. Already. Well, I, I am an actor first, and um, I, I've been acting for a long time, but mostly I've, I've, I've been directing. But I do have a several other characters. Some of them are silent characters, some of them not. Uh, there's a Jasper character who is sort of a, a bagman, hobo clown character, who's mm -hmm. also a silent character. And the Pierrot character, which I think actually the clip was of Pierrot and not oh, of Emo. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Emo okay. is uh, sort of traditionally dressed black and white. Oh, uh, that's trucks right. Okay. With hat and You're absolutely Right. And he's very sort of formal and, and aloof, more aloof. He's more the everyman character. But I also do some speaking characters here in town. I, I do uh, Leonardo da Vinci, which is um, for schools, touring into schools to relate art and science. And I do a Benjamin Franklin character. Benjamin Franklin. Hold that note because I would like to meet Benjamin Franklin and I think okay. our audience would too. Okay. And uh, if you'll stay tuned, we have a very important message coming up for you. And when we come back, we'll meet live and in person Benjamin Franklin. Thanks, Alan, for being Thank here. Thank you. Hey, it's an Oliver Otter pool roll. Fence your pool for safety and always keep gates locked. Be water wise. <laughs> Frank Camacho, getting the facts. Tommy Nunez, making the right call. Senator Armando Ruiz, negotiating the way. Rosa Carrillo, delivering the news. There are a lot of different parts to play in the American Red Cross. Play your part. Thanks for staying tuned. We are now graced with a very special guest, uh, Benjamin Franklin. He is the man who uh, uh, invented electricity, author, publisher, diplomat, statesman, and one of the founding fathers to the United States. And we're very pleased that he was able to be with us here today. Uh, at my age, I'm, I'm just pleased to be anywhere at all. <laughs> but I, I, I need to correct you there. I, I didn't invent electricity. Oh, well, I'm terribly I, I, sorry. I, um, I was just doing experiments, you see, with electricity, and, and um, I, I discovered that lightning was electricity. That's what I discovered. And up until that time, people didn't uh, know that? Well, no. They, they weren't sure. I, I, I said all along it, what, that it was, but uh, they all thought I was foolish, told me to go fly a kite, so that's what. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that happened. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, you know, I... Um, as a, one of the founding fathers of the United States, um, I, I know that you went through some very tough and difficult times at the beginning of our country, and uh, I see I, of a... I brought you a copy in case you didn't have Oh, um, a copy of the uh, Declaration of Independence. When, when in the course of human events it becomes a, that. Oh, yes, of course. I'm, I'm familiar with this What's document. What's the rest of it, then? Go ahead, tell me. <laughs> when in the course of human events it becomes necessary to... Uh, uh, <laughs> well, you better go read some I more better about read that, that again, yeah. shouldn't I? Well, uh, that's why I'm glad you're here to bring me that. What, uh, what do you think was perhaps the darkest time uh, in the beginning of our country? Do you have a memory of perhaps the darkest moment? Well, I think it was when I was trying to get them to write that, that darn... Declaration. I, uh, no one would agree with anything, and I was getting old, and I didn't think I had much more time. Little did I know, I'd just keep popping up. But I think that was, was one of the hardest things, the, the war, and, and I sort of got caught in the middle of all of that, you see, because I was, I was friendly with England for a while, and, and, the, and then one of my sons went to England, and, and it was difficult because we were in a war with them, and so... And, and separated uh, by great but, distances. But it was an exciting time as I, well because we, we could see what the possibilities were. And, and, I, and, I took, and, it's, and it's, it's good to know we were right. <laughs> well, it took a lot of forward vision to see that. Um, as much as you have 
told us now what perhaps was the toughest part or the darkest part. What was your happiest memory uh, of the of that time, of the beginning of the United States? Well, uh, again, I I believe the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The signing of this document. It is, it is the thing that I am most proud of. I, I did many things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I started the fire department and, and, and the, the library. Public and libraries. Public hospitals and, and, and paved streets and, 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 and street lights and, and the police department and, 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 and the, the fire insurance company. Well, I'm not so sure I'm proud of the insurance <laughs> company. But, well, but, we uh, won't tell anybody. But, How's that? But this has is the thing of which I am most proud. Well, and we, uh, we thank you for your vision and your foresight to have uh, given, really uh, fathered and birthed this country. It, it and was given my us duty. The, yes. Well, we're glad that you did. And there were a number of other men involved with you uh, in doing so. Uh, do you have some recollections of some of the um, famous people? Uh, that, that, uh, that Thomas Jefferson, I remember him. And he liked to play the violin, you see, and, and, and I would go over to, to his home, and, and he's supposed to be writing, and he'd be up there screeching around on that violin. <laughs> I said, you, you get busy on, on this. And he said it helped him think, and so far be it from me to decide. He was a great writer, you know. So. How yeah. about our greatest general, George Washington? Yes, yeah. George. Well, George, you know, um, interesting thing. George was sort of a sickly little boy. He, he was kind of puny, as a matter of fact, but... But he, he had a, a good heart and, and a good mind, and, and the men loved him, you say, and, and, and that's why they stuck with him through. Well, he must have gotten healthier because uh, you'd have to be a healthy man to make it through Valley Forge and the well, very cold winter there. Right. Well, when he was about 14, he sort, of got, he sort of got healthier. So, you know, I tell children that sometimes, you, you know, you, you may not seem so healthy and so strong, but, but things change in your life, you know, and, and you can cause that, that change to happen. I, I, I talk to them about reading a lot, too, you see, because I, I didn't have much formal education. I, I, I had two years, and the rest I learned by reading, you see. So I well, you not only learned to read, but you went on to become a very famous publisher and author. Uh, tell us what now was your most famous work. I, well, I have an idea in mind, but I'll let you tell. Well, it, it was called Poor Richard's Almanac. And you say I, I used and to... And did not refer to Richard Nixon, by the no, way. No. Okay. Who? Uh, <laughs> Richard Nixon, one of our presidents. Oh, oh that's um, like current day humor? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm terribly sorry. I that's didn't all right. interrupt I, 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 uh, well, uh, Poor Richard's I, I, Almanac yes, was it, written well, for... Well, yeah, I, I started it um, because, you know, to tell about the weather and, and things like that and... And I would put some of my inventions in, in, in the almanac, you see, like, like the, um, the stove and things. And I didn't make any money on my inventions. I gave them to the American people because that's what a person, you know, should do. But I made money on the almanac. Certainly, the Benjamin Franklin stove, uh, very famous. Yeah. Uh, many people have them in, our, in their homes to this very day. As a matter of fact, I, I know somebody uh, right now on the other side of the studio that has one <laughs> as well. Oh. I could take a look at that later. Uh, yeah. What, uh, uh, what do you feel that, oh, let's talk about, you brought the kite with you, oh. and uh, this, is, this is sort of how you were able to prove that there was electricity in lightning. Right. And uh, th from this discovery, we've been able to invent a lot of things. Now, the lightning rod is what I, I immediately invented. Yeah. It was a rod that would stick up on buildings, so the lightning would strike it and run the electricity away from the building, you see, so it, it, it wouldn't catch fire. So wouldn't be uh, quite as we, shocking a, we an were experience. Losing yeah. lot, lots of barns. Oh, I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Perhaps you could use one of these in in a future publication. Um, one of what? Uh, one of these little. Well, never mind. Jokes. Uh, oh, oh, you, oh, <laughs> like a. But sayings, a penny yes. saved is a penny. My favorite one is visitors and fish stink in three days. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. Do you have any other uh, favorite um, ones from... Uh, now, these were in Poor Richard's Almanac, right, right? Right, If your head is made of wax, don't walk in the sun. <laughs> that was a favorite one of mine. Let's see, what else? Um, Something about moderation, as I remember, which um, is my personal favorite. Well, yeah, moderation. That moderation. Well, I, my, mine was... My favorite, I should listen to my own advice, was, was eat to live. Don't live to eat. <laughs> but I, I wasn't too good. I, I mean, I could tell other people what to do, but I, I didn't always follow my own advice. Well, I think that goes hand in hand with moderation in all things, right. which, is, right. which is a part of moderation, that. Moderation, that's the moral moderation in all. 
You uh, we, currently we have a lot of things going on now. World changes taking oh, place, yeah. uh, and Europe now is going to become a, a common market uh, in 1992. Uh, you've spent a lot of time in Europe uh, in your later years. Do you have a fond memory of Europe? Well, and where were you in France? Is that right? I was in France. I was the ambassador to France. You know, and as a matter of fact, now that I think about it, if if I could get if I could get up to Washington on one of my visits, I keep popping up, I don't know why, and, and, but uh, they owe me some money still <laughs> from working, and, and they, they denied them, but, uh, some pay to me, and, and, and uh, they still owe me money. I should go up there, and, uh, but I understand we're not in too good a shape. So well, I, I think the secret, uh, Ben, if I may call you Ben, would be to get yourself elected to Congress, and um, then you, you could probably uh, write yourself a check on the House Bank and, and be, be well yeah, assured of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I heard about that. We, <laughs> we didn't. I know that you travel around to a lot of elementary schools that's, and talk to elementary right. children. Very briefly, before we have to end here, what would you like school children today to know? What's the most important thing you could tell them? That, it's in, that education is important. That, that reading is important because it leads to creative thinking, and creative thinking leads to creative problem solving. And that it's not the teacher's responsibility to give them an education. It's their responsibility to get it from the teacher. How would you like to be remembered by history? Well, I, I wrote an epitaph. It goes like this. The body of B. Franklin, printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents borne out and stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here, food for worms. But he may be replaced by another man. Something like that. My goodness. Well, we want to thank you for being here. Ben Franklin, uh, it, it was our pleasure. It was my pleasure. Very good luck to you, Van Kortz, and thank you. And I think we need a little uh, patriotic music to take us out. We want to thank you, the viewers, for being with us on the New Variety Art Show. Please join us next time, same time, same channel on your public access station. And remember, folks, support Variety Arts in your community. Bye-bye, everybody. That's very good.